Good morning and happy Saturday to everyone. We hope that this morning finds you well wherever you may be. Thank you for tuning in to take a look with Dr. Quinyon Nancy Scott and Christina Cook, Washington Post Teacher of the Year. Yes, Washington <laughs> Post Teacher of the Year. So this morning, um, with all of the matter that happened in, in our country mm -hmm. um, this week, um, thinking about um, yesterday, we laid to rest um, one of the greats. And um, as I was watching the news cook, I never realized that they called her um, Notorious. Notorious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yes, what a name. And so definitely, um, you know, thinking about um, her family and as um, our current president-ish um, decides to um, have a U.S. Supreme Court nomination that's a woman, um, we just hope that it's the right woman. Um, because the current nomination definitely there's some question yeah. and then of course um, Kentucky is still mm -hmm. suffering there's um, protests all across the country because again we were just told that we ain't shit I mean I, I really wanted to say something yeah. nicer yeah, but, that's but the when yeah. I think about how they were able to just bombard her home and kill her sleeping and pay no cost yeah. Um, what a tragedy it's been. Mm -hmm. And so the truth of the matter is like, heavy is the head, right? right? We have so much responsibility and in education, it doesn't stop. Like it's just this continuous responsibility. And so as we've been talking and talked about that it's pretty much the teacher of color and in, in schools sometimes that they have the hardest classes, yeah. um, specifically behavior problems. Mm -hmm. So if you give the teacher who's stern, the teacher who has this great statue, we'll give them all the bad classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, why? Are you ready for me to answer yeah, that? Yeah, why? <laughs> like, why does the teacher that is just as gifted as the other person, yeah. why is it that they have to be responsible for getting the bad kids? I think it speaks to this idea that black kids are a burden. And mm -hmm. who better to bear the burden than the black woman? And not to get all historically based on you all, but when we think back to the institution of slavery, it was black women raising other people's children and taking care. And when we look at movies like The Help, it was the black woman, the nanny, right? Taking care, bringing order back to disorder. And so, you know, it speaks to what we talked about last week about whose responsibility is it to bear the cost to um, discipline and for African-American teachers, we fit, it's not our responsibility, we're not responsible, but we hold it as our responsibility to teach the extra lesson, to go the extra mile. And I'm here to tell you today, Dr. Scott, black folks, we tired. Black teachers are tired. We're tired. Can I say you just messed me up? <laughs> because like, I knew your answer was gonna be great, but when you took us back to slavery, I'm just sitting here in awe, like, are you as close as I am? I'm sitting here yeah. like, really? Yeah, it's deep. But when you think about our responsibility has always been able, has always been to take on the burden. Yeah. And so now, even in education, mm -hmm. we are taking on the most difficult students. Yes, we are. Whether that is behavioral, whether that's social, emotional, emotional or whether that is low academic. Yes, yeah. absolutely. We are responsible. And, and I'm thinking about two situations that's happened in my career um, one I was at Lombard Middle School and I always had the top class yeah like always for real I was there for like four years mm -hmm. and I pride myself on being able to you know like you know tier system right yeah, like, absolutely. I get to have the top class everybody was African-American pretty much just about probably 95% one of those kind of schools mm -hmm. in the heart in the middle of Baltimore yeah. in between like four different housing projects mm -hmm. and my principal came to me and was like, this year you're not going to have the top class. You're going to have 804, 802, and 801. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why? Yeah. So I told the yeah. students that they were given to me because they were special scholars. They didn't even believe me the scholars was a word. Yeah. 
And I remember Eric White, I think his first name was Eric, but definitely he was white and his name was Mr. White. Mm -hmm. And he was able to get the top students. And it bothered me yeah. that he was able to get the top students. I had to take the lesser, well, the students who did not qualify as the top. So in Baltimore City, we've talked about this, it's a mm -hmm. tier system. The top students go to citywide schools. Typically, if you're not in the top middle school class, you don't go to citywide. Yeah. And so I felt like I had prepared myself to understand the system enough to get these students in citywide, but it taught me a lesson. Mm -hmm. The 804 students rose to the occasion. Asia, absolutely. I put them online. Yeah. And I was like, look, we're going to eat together. Yay. We're going to work together. Shout out to all the Greeks. They got to the <laughs> point where you couldn't even sit at their lunch table yeah. because they were so confident in who they were yeah. as 804. But that love for supporting 804 came from being hurt yep. that I didn't have 805. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also thinking about, so before I was the principal of the Academy for College and Career Exploration, I was a teacher there. Mm -hmm. And I love my predecessor, shout out to Ira Mitchell. They had these students, these girls, off the chain. It was yeah. like six of them. Mm -hmm. So not like a whole bunch, just six. A few. Yeah. They created a whole class for me with just six <laughs> girls yeah. because these girls were just off the chain. And but I love them though. Mm -hmm. Like they're they're all my Facebook friends still now mm -hmm. and they've done so great. But I'm thinking about I can't believe these six girls, they they couldn't go to Miss Elise De La Matra's class anymore. Right. They had to come to Miss Goodlow's class because they were technically to misbehave. Yeah. It is not the responsibility of the black teacher to check other black children. I get it. Yeah, it isn't. We do it because we're our our end goal is like academic gains and so we, our first line of defense is let me get the behavior in check first then I can teach the academics but the truth be told when you rise the academics up the behavior falls into place right when you rise up how you expect kids to show up how you expect kids to turn in assignments how you expect kids to think then you rise and so I'm calling out all administrators um, about how we're coaching right and and we need to start leading from this lens that I've heard Dr. Scott share this it's called transformative leadership where we start to shift the mindset of people that are leading the children that we need to be around right and so this is what we both know and we said this before who you are as an individual is how you show up in the classroom mm -hmm. so if you have low self-esteem if you have low expectations for your life if you are not studied if you're not well read then that exudes onto teachers and to children and everyone that you interact with and i'm gonna say this i'm we on fire today okay because <laughs> i'm a little man right yeah now. i am too as a as a professional if you don't think your career, your craft is important enough for you to study and to be high tech, high touch, high knowledgeable on everything you're putting in front of children, then shame on you. Because kids always rise. No matter where they begin, they will always rise to the occasion if the expectation is there. Who sets the expectation? You do. And it doesn't mean you become mom. It means you become, as we say, teacher technician. And we want to say good morning to everybody that's on Instagram and on like, y'all are with us this morning. I can't see all the comments. Our producer will let us know um, what people are saying, but we certainly want to hear from you this morning. I, look at my look at my special Christy. Honey, she is tearing the chat up this morning. Hey, um, Christy. And she knows because she used to work in Chicago City Public Schools, so she knows exactly what we're talking about. And you know, <laughs> one of the things that you mentioned that I think is just so profound is studying to show thyself approved. Yeah. And we get to a point in our career that we no longer feel like we have to study. Come on, so come on, come on. Start I'm up in now. my 40s. <laughs> I've been doing this thing for way too long. So I no longer need to embrace myself in life learning material yeah. because I already have it mm -hmm. or I really don't have to dive deep because everything just repeats itself so I'm doing the same thing over and over again why do you feel like once people got it mm -hmm. they no longer need to go to the drawing board and, and you know this yeah. so when you were a leader and we worked together the number of folks who didn't even turn in the lesson plan. I mean, it was it was egregious, if you will. And here's the piece. It's about like accountability. So if I feel like nobody's checking behind me, right, then I'm not going to do the thing. And it doesn't matter what it is, right? Think about it. When was the last time you cleaned underneath your couch? 
if you have wood floors or even if you have carpet, right? If nobody's going in that area, it's not important to you. But when we step up our level of accountability for teachers, teachers will step up their level of accountability for students. But I think that when you have stu a teacher has students' lives on the yeah, line. Yeah, absolutely. So that's completely different than, you know, the outside of my home right. looks nice. But if you go into the closet, you'll be like, what in the world? <laughs> but, you know, when you're talking about the lives of children, you really have an opportunity to either make the child, yeah. make the child meaning that you provide things within them, self-confidence, mm -hmm. academic ability, yeah. intellectual savvy that you believe that the child is able to grow and continue. And it really truly only takes one bad teacher to yeah. break everything yeah. exactly that good <clears throat> teachers have embedded and even parents because the reality of it is is that students are sitting there wanting something and, and there's mm -hmm. this innate where students believe that because you're the teacher you really do have the ability yeah. Yeah. and so we, we see this hear this all the time where the teacher the counselor told the student you're not going to be anything mm -hmm. and they hold on to that for decades yeah, you know fact. or they told that they were going to be successful and they hold on to that for decades, decades. Yeah. and so you hear people give homage to their teacher it's because of them that I'm in this place mm -hmm. or you know you get the call like I'm graduating please come join yeah. me yeah. where people are looking for somebody to just believe in them yeah. and sometimes it is the black teacher yeah. but if the black teacher or teacher of color, because it's not always black, but if that teacher of color is dealing with their own issues, even mm -hmm. though because, and, and, and you know what, can I just say this? Yes, I'm, say I'm guilty of this. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the number of black men mm -hmm. that I hired, mm -hmm. and in every school I went to, I always tried to hire more black mm -hmm. men, because in my mind, I believe that having more men in the building would be able to shift culture. Yeah. Yeah. But it was horrible yeah. when the man was weak. Oh, and I my God! I, and <laughs> oh, because you just don't expect when you you know I come from a family of strong Woo. men. Shout out to my uncles and my cousins; they're strong men. Yes. So dealing with these wow. weak ass, sorry sucking, like come on, oh come my on. goodness. Um, but Dr. Scott, I just couldn't. I was, you know, I don't know how to deal with it. And, and I'm like, Dad, I, I probably right. missed out on hiring someone who was more effective, yeah. more efficient, because I gave honor and homage to the black man. And in, in many cases, it worked. We had some black men teams that rocked and rolled over yeah. time. But the... The sorry ones cook. Yeah, I know. I mean, the, the suck. We work with some. We the did. sorry ones. <laughs> we did. It bothered me with these weak men yeah. that, you know, they had like a maybe a passion for children. Yeah. But they could never help the community yeah. because they were dealing with so many of their own inadequacies. Pussy. Yeah, broken they were pieces just can't weak. repair themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like this. You can have a passion for children, but not be in education. You should just do community service. Does that make sense? Because the work That's that we real. okay, the work that we do, this is ministry work, which means you're gonna have to get down and dirty. It means you're gonna not be paid everything you feel that you're worth, but the payout is so much greater than what you thought it would be when you see the final product of a kid or a family. And so I think it speaks to like adults and professionals, right? Checking yourself about, is this for you? For she and I, we've decided to make education our life's work. And that's why we tune in to shows like this to continue to have the conversations because we're getting older, right? We're 20 plus some years in. We're combined more than that in the game. And we're now passing the torch off to this next group of teachers who need to be equipped to deal with children who have more access to information than we ever had access to. Kids who now uh, confidently say, I'm, I need to speak to my therapist. I need to see the counselor. Kids who confidently advocate for themselves. And that is a shift in education that many of us are not prepared for because we still have these old mindsets like kids should be seen and not heard. I'm the teacher, it's my room. No, it's not your room. That space belongs to you and those children. And when you teach community, when you build community, you will get community. What does the old African proverb say? The uh, um, the child will burn down the village when she doesn't feel he or she doesn't feel love to feel the warmth of that community. And so until we check ourselves on our motives, 
right? Our inadequacies, our biases, we're never going to see the type of success we need to close achievement gaps because it doesn't have to take long. I mean, I've literally seen kids go from being five grades level and caught up in one year because of what? Consistency, love, and hard work. That's what it's going to take. But again, how are you showing up every single day? Are you consistent? Dr. Scott mentioned lesson plans. Like, how are you going to teach kids without a plan? Like, I don't understand that. Even if you, Dr. Scott calls them dirty plans. On a piece of loose leaf paper, rip it out your binder, but you cannot get in front of children and you haven't planned. Period. It just, it just doesn't work that way. You can't wing it. We don't care how good you are. You can't wing it. Because... One of the things we've learned with teaching is you won't be able to give kids the amount of rigor that they need when you're doing it on the spot. And, and, and I can't imagine, let's say we go to get LASIK, because you see we both wear glasses. That's what we call take a look. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't imagine she and I going to get a LASIK procedure done and the eye doctor had not planned out the procedure and had not sketched what could happen, the misconceptions, I'm talking teacher language now, what could happen, what could go wrong with this procedure? And so many times we're treating our students just like that. We're not planning, we're winging it, we think it doesn't matter, but baby, it matters. It, it does, and I love <laughs> that you use the word misconceptions because I can remember having data-driven conversations, yeah. talking about let's frame this conversation. Let's hey, Mr. Hammond, let's Baltimore City in the building. <laughs> Yay, Baltimore City. Let's look at the data. Let's evaluate the data. And part of that I always believed is that if a teacher already knows the or can predict the misconceptions of a mm -hmm. child, they have a better concrete way of teaching that because they can already plan for what the student may not get. Yeah, absolutely. But if most teachers, I'm, I'm thinking about this, and I, I'm using myself mm -hmm. as an example, mm -hmm. because I can remember, um, I think I might have taught for like seven or eight years before I went into leadership, and I can remember at some point only doing lesson plans because I had to. Mm -hmm. Thinking like, I've been teaching this forever. I know this front mm -hmm. and backwards. Mm -hmm. um, especially when I had the autonomy to teach whatever I, I wanted to, mm -hmm. which is very dangerous yeah. educators. How do you be reflective mm -hmm. enough to say, am I the problem? Mm -hmm. Because we blame the students. Yeah, we do. It's so easy to blame the students. It's so easy to blame their families. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to blame the income of those families. Yeah. It's so easy to blame how they show up. Yeah. How do we become the man in the mirror yeah. where we evaluate what are we doing that we are not impacting children the way we should yeah. based on how we've been trained? So, like, it's twofold now. And now that I'm in administration, like, I see it from a different lens, right? Mm -hmm. It's my job to make teachers better because everyone doesn't show up as the superstar. And so if I see gaps with teachers, right, I look at my team of teachers that I work with as like my own students. So how would I categorize uh, these students if they were in my class? Where are the gaps that they need? And then it's my job to fill in the gaps for them, whether it's changing their mindset, whether it's changing how they look at content, whether it's changing how they plan, and the feedback has to be quick and consistent. We call them like little small hits, right? Not this long, you know, verbose, Da, 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 da. what's going to give us the highest lever for achievement when they go back in the classroom and do it? And if you can give teachers those quick hits and encourage them as they do the work, you're going to see a vast improvement in the classroom. So I think part of being reflective is being humble and realizing that, no, you don't always have the answers and no, you're not always correct. And I think it goes back to like, what is your own personal philosophy on education? Do you see yourself as being like the leader in the room or do you see yourself as the facilitator and the coach of the information and everybody in the room gets an at bat at being the teacher? Yeah, and, and I think that's great. I think one of the things that we don't do enough in schools, I'm thinking about learning walks. Yeah. And just because we're not in schools, we can mm -hmm. do virtual learning we sure walks. Can. I'm also thinking about, do you remember we used to do ghost walks? We did. Where we did. just the, so ghost walk is where you go into a room, there are no children. Right. And you just evaluate what's on the walls. Mm -hmm. Does the classroom look like it matches the content in which the teacher's teaching? Yeah. Is the student reflective in the classroom? Mm -hmm. How does the student show up? Do you have 
have graded work yeah. available for the students. How about updated graded work uh, on the wall? Amen. <laughs> you know, including, do you have, you know, agenda? Yeah. Is there clear accountability for both the educator yeah. And the te and the student inside of the classroom without anyone being in the room that you just show up the yeah. ghost walk. And so as I thought about what we can do to help students, I thought about you know the administrator sometimes gets stuck and bogged down with other things. Yeah. So it really becomes difficult to support. Mm -hmm. train, yeah. um, provide materials mm -hmm. and resources to teachers, and then it's the onus on the teachers mm -hmm. to actually make sure that they read, mm -hmm. deep dive, continue to practice. Yeah. How do you think that we need to bridge that gap? Yeah, I think it like it's a structural thing, right? I think it's about like planning. So, and this is just something to consider for everyone. Do you write down everything that needs to get done every single day? including checking emails, including taking a break to drink water, including running to the restroom. Because here's what I'm learning. If you do not write it down, it isn't going to happen. And so I think part of becoming a better educator is managing the time that you have with children. Because some of us believe, let's just give them more time. More time doesn't make you better. More time can actually just make it worse if it's bad instruction, right? Think about those of us who are working out and we're lifting weights. So if, we're, if we're using the wrong technique, and let's say we're doing it for an hour, we've gotten no results because we have the wrong technique. Let's get the right technique. Let's do it for a shorter period of time. Let's shock our bodies, right? Let's shock kids, you know, with these quick hits and then watch momentum build. So for me, I'm no longer getting caught up in those like water cooler conversations with people about things that aren't moving the needle. If we're not talking about building better readers and writers and scholars and mathematicians and geographer and scientists, if we're not talking about data, then we're not having a conversation. If you're not coming with your data about how you feel, not what's going on always with children, but hey, I, I noticed that I'm feeling this kind of way. I felt this way for three out of five days this week. I need some help, right? We, we can't keep dealing, Scott, in like emotion. Emotion won't move the needle. Emotion doesn't pay the bills. And so what happens is this. I, I call it learn good. helplessness good. right good. when you're tired then you push that negative energy onto children and then you give them an out there is no out in education right like so it's like well you know i'm tired today so it's friday so we're just gonna watch a movie right who does that but when you're playing there isn't an out when you're playing, you're thinking about three months ahead. You're thinking six months ahead. When you're playing, you already know the outcome. Let me give you some more examples. Imagine building a home without a blueprint. You, you, you have nothing. So again, why do we not take those same concepts and drive them into education? Is it a lot? Yes, but you signed up for it. And so part of that is like managing your time, right? Teachers, here's the deal. And Dr. Scott and I, we've been guilty of it. How many of you have brought work home? And you didn't grade it because it sat in your car. Mm -hmm. Stop bringing work home that you don't plan on grading because what you're doing to your psyche is disappointing yourself every day, right? Uh, only give kids things that you know you're going to score so that you can get it back to them in a timely fashion. That was a growth area for me because um, I taught English and I would give kids, you know, really big writing assignments all the time. Now, I would be there for the beginning part, the the note catcher. I would know the thesis statement. I would know the evidence. But when all the papers came in, it would take me a little bit longer to get through all of them. And so one of the things I realized that was happening for some kids is breaking trust. So if I said, hey, you're going to have your paper back by Friday, Friday comes and I don't have it. All I'm doing again is setting kids up to know that my expectations are low. And then when they don't turn something in on time, now I'm mad at them. But guess who modeled the bad habit? Mm -hmm. I did. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I did. So mm -hmm. it's something to think about. Like, how are we spending our day? How are we planning? Who are we around? Who are some of our teacher friends, right? Are they successful or are they raggedy? Because if your teacher colleagues are raggedy, guess what, boo? You raggedy. You are the average of the five people that you associate with the most, even in education. If they're always in the teacher's lounge, kiki and kaka, and they're not grading work, guess what happens to you? You're not grading work. Yeah, it's definitely a shift. Mm -hmm. Our time is up. Wow. 
Just that fast. <laughs> Just that fast. What, what the folks saying on here? Um, we will respond to you, and I don't know, we may have to do a part two. Yeah. I didn't do the disclaimer. Uh, we are representing ourselves. We do not represent the organization in mm -hmm. which we work from. And so this information, our values, our system, we're coming to you authentically as us. Mm -hmm. But we appreciate you tuning in to take a look. We look forward to seeing you again next, next. Saturday, same place same time mm -hmm. have a great week for those of you that pray pray for our country yeah um and for those of you that don't we're praying for you yep. take care bye